Welcome back to Play Tessie. It's episode 53, and if you're listening on Drop Day, it is March 18th. Episode 53, the Rich Hill episode, one of not just I don't, how many he might have worn like three or four numbers with the Red Sox. Rich right? Hill he has probably had every number in the majors. 44, too. He wore 44 as well. Oh, 44, that's me. You know what's that? <laughs> you know what that's from? No. You remember the uh, Geico ad with the the guy who's getting how he's right, buying I, meat? No, Coop. Hold Gordo, on. I don't know how does name. your brain work? You're <laughs> you remember commercials, but you don't know pop culture references. Like Dude, what yeah, is this? my sports fan? Sports fan. I, but I, I like I love it. Like well, do when you, not you turn on like ad? like ESPN, that is that is you in human form. Yeah, Coop. The guy was buying meat. And they call his number, and he's doing like the his touchdown dance. Who forty four? That's me. And he's like spiking the card with his number on it. You don't know what I'm talking about. No, it's I know what you're talking about, but it's just line. hilarious to me that like your entire your entire existence is just like sports and like live sports nonsense. It, it, no, it's beautiful. It I love it. You are art. Oh, I'm, I'm very pure, but yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of nonsense that goes on in my head, but. This is the official podcast of catching. Oh, well, it's nonsense. But no, no. Goop, this this podcast here, it's the official podcast of catching ten bead necklaces on St. Patrick's Day, also known as the official Red Sox podcast of WEI. We've got Lou Merloni on the show today. Lou Freeman Merloni. And it was a hell of an interview. But yes. before we get into that interview. You can't get there without hitting that subscribe button. So whether you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Odyssey app, just remember, hit that subscribe button and give us that five-star rating. Leave a comment. Too. Tell us what you think of our Lou Maloney interview after you hear it. We're also on YouTube, the WEI page. We've got our own playlist. So hit that thumbs up button on YouTube and tell us there. Tell us there what you thought of the interview too. We're also on socials at Playtesty on both Twitter and Instagram. Here with Coop and Sammy today, and we're about to be joined by Lou Maloney. You guys got anything you want to just jump right into this thing? I think that people are going to love this because we basically went down the laundry list of questions about the Red Sox. And who better to ask than Lou Maloney, former player, locked in with the team now. He's down at the fort. I'm fired up after that interview. I thought that was great, and I think people will like it. And I hope you, the listener... Enjoy. <laughs> maybe, maybe the best season preview out there right now. You could, yeah, it's yeah. A, it was season preview. Yeah, we'll I would say that was better. pretty. That was pretty close to a season preview. If you had to ask us, like, if Netflix were list. to put a description on their docu series next year, uh, everything that was said would be fit into. It would just you insert it right there. It'd be long. I don't think everyone would read it, but that would be the perfect description of the season. Tiny, tiny text, just like the, the preview. MLB uniforms. So, yeah. Yeah. But right. it's awesome interview. Really excited for you guys to hear it. Lose the best. He's as good of a Red Sox mind and baseball mind as there is covering the game right now. So, we're really excited for you to hear this, guys. Let's just jump right in, man. Here's our interview with Lou Merloni. We're joined on this beautiful St. Patrick's Day by a man, the man of the people. I don't think it's going too far to say he's the voice of Red Sox Nation. It's WEI and Nesson's own Lou Merloni. How you doing, Lou? Good to meet you, man. I'm, I'm good, boys. Good to have. Thanks for having me. It's a good time. Yeah, beautiful day, St. Patty's Day. Little long game, but uh, he put up nine in the first inning. What do you expect? I mean, you can't. Yeah. can't be not happy about a Devers homer. Devers three run homer. Yeah, he's been doing that all spring. Like, he looks fantastic. Um, lowered his hands a little bit. So, now, you know, remember the fastball's up that he's blowing, you know, not catching up to, and I think chasing, and as aggressive as he is, you know, he, there's still times when he gets himself out early in counts. But, I mean, I, I feel like watching his at-bats in camp, there's, like, at least a pitch or two, like, in every at-bat that I'm like, he would have swung at last year you know but he's laying off and he's getting in better counts and he's swinging the strikes and he's driving ball the other way i mean he's he's pretty locked in you know it's good to see it's that going the other way that does it for me like we saw that so yeah. much early in his career and that's what made watching his at bats so impressive and then not that not that they weren't last year he was still objectively awesome last year but 
seeing him do that, it just opens up so many doors for him. And player the ceiling is so much higher when he's spraying the ball all over the field. Yeah, and I think a lot of that has to do with, too, like where his hands are. You know, one of the issues for him last year was hands starting up over his head. When he would kind of move his hands and get ready to hit, like he would lose his hands, like with his body. Like his body would float forward, and his hands would still be way back. And and a lot of that time, his tennis swing got really long, and he got real pull happy. Um, and his pull percentage last year was a lot higher than it's been. Ironically, I think the like hitting the ball the other way percentage was kind of even. It's just up the middle was way, way down. So he wasn't using the middle part of the field. But now where his hands are, it's all like one piece again. You know, it's almost like closer to where he wants to load and hit from, which allows him to see the ball longer, which allows him to make better decisions to swing, you know, swing decisions. So he um, – but, yeah, going the other way, when he starts doing that, there's really – you try to figure out how to get him out, right? And then your way to get him out is to get him to chase. So if he's seeing pitches better and laying off some balls, it's really dangerous at bat. So when you see a big change like that, because it's pretty pronounced, his hands, like you said, were pretty much above his head to start last year. The new stance kind of looks like the old, old stance when he first came into the majors. My question is, how does a progression like that happen? Because it was pretty clear to the amateur eye myself that the hands were high, don't see the benefit, now they're lower. How does a progression like that occur? I think it kind of happens just over time. You know, a lot of times it's funny because I know as a hitter, you know, you really don't notice things until you watch video and you're like, man, you know, like I, my stride, I'm really open, you know, or my hands are really high. My hands are really low. And, and then you, it's funny because like if your hands are, are kind of low and you want to raise them, you can raise them like an inch or two. And you personally feel like you've raised them like a foot, mm -hmm. you know, because it's just so weird. So like over time, you know, your hands can raise and get higher and higher and higher. And, and sometimes you don't even realize it until you see some video of it. And you go back and look at your video from a year before or earlier in the year. And you, that, that's kind of how you, that's old school of like how at least we used to do it. Now there's so much technology, who knows? But I think something like that just happens over time. And then it gets, why am I getting blown away by fastballs a lot? And it's right. just like, well, we got to reduce some movement. We got to get you in a good hitting position, which I think more hitters are doing now. Like just kind of getting there, loading up with a body lean. Because there's so much power in the game, you just don't have time. To, you know, hit 97, 98, up in the zone. So they just sort of start there, and they start to try to get comfortable as soon as they can, and obviously he is. Right. So, Lou, obvious the news of the week with the Patriots. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Wink Wink <laughs> Winkowski moved yeah. to the bullpen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that That's that's the news of the weekend for us. Like, yeah. you, you obviously heard from Coral today, and – I think a lot of that speaks because Winkowski obviously has been working on stuff, but a lot of it speaks how Tanner, how can Garrett Whitlock have looked. So are those two your guys for the four and five spots? And what have you seen from them that you've liked so far? I think we're at the point where you sort of accept the fact that they are right. Like I, I think you know, Cora was saying at the end of last year, I remember in Baltimore saying that uh, there's some guys in this team that, you know, uh, he said Winkowski, they, they viewed him as a starter. And then he mentioned some about guys might spend some time down at AAA that have been here for a few years. And right away, I just thought, like, if they think Winkowski's a starter, they want him to be stretched out and start down at AAA. And it kind of almost seemed like that was going to be a plan. Um, but another plan was also to get two starters, you know, and to be able to do that. And they never did. So it got to the point where, like, can they even afford to have, like, Winkowski and Cooper Criswell down in AAA – so when a guy goes down, you can call him up the spot start um, and rather than, like, say, Kyle Barraclaw, right, or somebody like that. Try to have somebody. That good. name gives me shivers, Lou, yeah. I, I, I got to say. So that was kind of like a plan. Um, unfortunately, you didn't really sign two guys. And then when Giolito goes down, then it turns into they're not going to be able to do this. Like, because if, if Giolito's down and Whitlock's in AAA and how can Whitlock, how can uh, Whit rather, are in the uh, rotation of Winkowski's in AAA. Now, all of a sudden, this great bullpen, you're wondering what it is. You know, mm -hmm. wh what is it? Like, who gets the ball to Jansen and Martin? Like, Campbell, Slayton, Weissert, like, Bernardino? Like, so I just don't think they had the benefit to be able to do what they wanted to do because they didn't go out and get the starting pitching that maybe they thought they were going to. So, so uh, I, I've got a bit of a question there where Hauk came off of a start today where – First two innings were solid. Third inning gets shaky. Can't get out of the fourth. 
how deep into the season do you think it will take before we actually see some mix up in the rotation? Uh, if that happens or if they just like from the jump, just start mixing things up. You know, unfortunately, I, I don't know what their options are, you know, and that's kind of, you know, the really the biggest issue on this team is the lack of starting pitching. Like they have really good players and they have some good arms, but I, I barring an injury, you know, Winkowski, I guess if he's stretched out, um, but you, you can do Huck like two starts and just say, nope, it didn't work. So I think these, I think they roll with it. You it's know, just basically and, dependent on who gets injured first. Yeah, I think they, they roll with it because if Wake's in the bullpen, then basically Cooper Criswell's your own depth until we start yeah. getting down to Richard Fitz and, and Sandling. You know, it's like those guys need a little bit more time. So um, they're so thin in the rotation that, you know, Hauk is going to be there. Whitlock is going to be there. Crawford is going to be there. And probably Pavetta and Bale, I would imagine. Chris Well, maybe depth down in AAA. And that's kind of how it's shaking out. And, and the worst part about it is like, you know, Hauk, you know, three and two thirds today. I mean, everyone's praising his numbers and how he's a lock for the rotation. He's also only thrown home games. Um, he's only, only started two of those home games. So on three of those home games, he came in in the fourth or fifth inning. And as you guys know, spring training away lineups, they're not like the A lineup, like, the, you know, like today they had Rizzo and that was it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a lot of bench guys. It's a lot of triple A guys. It's a lot of role players. So when you're coming in in the fifth inning against that lineup and those guys are already out of the game, you're dominating double A hitters, you know, and triple A hitters. Now that's not to take away from the fact that he's got good shit. We know he's got good shit and he's really good pitcher. He's got velocity, everything. We know that, but I'd like to see him throw an away game against an A lineup kind of like how Bayo did today out in Atlanta. Yeah, and obviously you're not going to see it in spring training, but we, oh. we've seen a lot from how it could go in like three, four innings and looking great, but then it falls apart in the fifth or sixth, and we'll we'll see when it gets to the season on that, but yeah. And you're not going to find that find that out, <laughs> really, on any yeah. of these guys. Like Cutter yeah. Crawford last year, kind of like a pitch count, and, and – like they've said before, like basically from pitch 70, 75 to like 90, like this stuff actually did diminish a little bit, right? Fastball, breaking ball. Um, so they feel like he's stronger. And because of that, maybe we won't see that. But you're not going to find that out here in camp. He's not going to get to that point. If he does, it's going to be for one outing. And by that 75 to 90 pitch count, who's he facing? We're not going to know if Tanner Howick is going to be effective in the fifth, sixth inning, the third time through the order because he's never going to face any of those guys. You this know, is all super upbeat. That's awesome. <laughs> but it's just, it, it's, it's, that's true. like the harsh reality of it. It's true. Yeah. It's like, you, yeah. you can't get the answers you're looking for. Like, like, will you be able to find out if Garrett Whitlock can stay healthy throughout the year and give you five or six solid innings in the next 10 days? Like, I don't think so. So yeah, you'll find out when you find out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Their hands are tied. They don't have any other options. You know, when G Lito goes down and they were, you know, for some reason refuse to go out and get Jordan Montgomery. You don't have a lot of flexibility in your decision making. It is what it is. So you ride those guys and hope and hope that a healthy off season for Whitlock, a healthy off season for How, a much bigger, stronger, you know, Cutter Crawford is the difference. Uh, Lou, we talked about this uh, last week and the week before. We talk about it a lot. How we saw these guys kind of run out of gas last year in both the rotation and the bullpen. Rotation kind of leading to the guys in the bullpen getting burnt out. Is it a little over dramatic to say that this roster building is bordering on neglectful because it's it's hard to see it's hard to not see the same thing happening again in 2024? Well, I would say that hopefully defensively they're going to be better and that will help. You know, um, but you know, thinking about getting to 162 with five starters, three of them you're not sure of if they can last. You know, like give you length, and the sixth one being Cooper Criswell. Like I don't know, you need more starters than that. So the, the depth is definitely going to be challenging. But, like, I look at Cutter Crawford last year. His guy got affected the most by his defense because he's on the 85 pitch count, right, in that range, 90 pitch count. And when he has to throw an extra 15 pitches, 20 pitches, because his defense isn't making plays that they should, that turns into four and two-thirds. You know, mm -hmm. when you have ground ball guys like Whitlock, ground ball guys like Hauk, um, ground ball guys like Bayo, if double plays aren't turned to end an inning, if plays just aren't made in the outfield or in the infield, Innings are extended, pitches are thrown, and it turns into four and two thirds. Like if you know, they were an awful defensive team last year. If they were a good, you know, to above average defensive team, you would have got more innings from your starters. 
because they wouldn't have to throw so many pitches, right, to kind of get through four or five innings. So it all kind of ties into one another. So on the yeah, topic of defense, like we've been talking about this guy a lot, Von Grissom, and it's unfortunate we really haven't gotten to see much of him because of the injury. Um, I just want to know what have you what have you seen from Grissom, if anything? What have you heard about him defensively? And where are you standing on where he fits in with this team? Well, he's a big bitch. I mean, he is a big <laughs> – he's a big boy, you know. Like, he kind of looks – you know, when Bogey first came up, you saw the frame and you knew it was going to fill out. And by about week – year three, year four, you're like, wow, yeah, he's getting big. Like, that's where Grissom is now. Mm -hmm. Like, he's a big kid. And I, I saw him hit early on. A um, lot of pop. Fenway would be good for him. Uh, took Giolito Oppo into a bullpen during live BP one day. Like, he can swing it. But it's just unfortunate he's missing a lot of time defensively. And I, I talked to him. He said he feels comfortable there. Um, I did see him kind of take balls to his left at second, like that shorter throw to first base. And it seemed a little bit like, wait a minute, how do I throw this here? Right? Because I'm a long over the arm, long arm action shortstop. And now I got to just kind of flip it from the side. Yeah. So that, that looked like it was a little awkward, like he's got to get used to it. So there's still questions about him defensively. Like there's some people that say he's going to be perfectly fine that I've talked to that have seen him play. He'll be perfectly fine this transition. Um, then there's other people that think he's a left fielder. So, I, you know, I, I haven't seen enough of him to know, but you'd like to think he can make that transition and be your second baseman because I think he can swing the bat with it as well. So looking at the fact that he's going to be here for a solid amount of time now, and it's all yeah. kind of hope that all these guys pan out, do you see him most likely slotting in at second base for good? Is that kind of what the Red Sox hope is here with both, you know, I mean, they have a wealth of middle infielder like prospects. So it's kind of where do all these guys kind of, I guess, Plinko wise boil down to where they are going to be once they're at the big league level. I mean, I'm just my whole thought now is when I look at this team is like, where do these guys fit? And I, like, Von Grism, of course, you want him at that second base position. But if he's if it's difficult, is it left field? Yeah, I, th I think that's kind of yet to be played out, right? Let's see him kind of get over there and how he feels. I think he's your best second base prospect in the organization. You know, he's still a kid. Um, Meyer could change a little bit of that, like depending on what happens with him. He's got to stay healthy, and he's got to kind of – I think he's got to stay healthy because I, I think he's a really good player, talented player. They still love him, but uh, health is a concern. That you just, I just need to see like a full year from him, right? Like it's hard to kind of show what you can do if you're always hurt, but – um, I think he's, you know, well ahead of a guy like, like Nick York, who, who I think they like, but this kid's still a young kid. So you try them there. And I don't think you try him for a month. You know what I mean? I thought this is one of those things where like, he hopefully can make the plays at second base and by the all-star break, he's better. And by September, he's settling in. And now you feel really good about him defensively and offensively at second. He's the guy. So, so I mean, like, oh. that kind of makes me think back And this is, like kind of the whole issue of how the off season is off season is gone is ownership or not really ownership, but the front office not being straight with what they want to do. And we heard at the beginning that they weren't dead set on keeping all these prospects and they would be open to trading some of their higher valued guys. And then now kind of showing that, Hey, these guys are the future. We want to clutch them. I mean, do you see, it's tough to see what they're, they want to do with these guys, but where do you think that they are? leaning with some of these higher valued prospects now like are they clutching them or are they going to try and see what they can get for them you think i think it all kind of ties in together as far as like spending money and belief that these guys can win and when the timing is for that and that's the time to kind of move on from some of these prospects i, th I think if you're going to approach an off season the way the red sox approach this off season it is like you know why am i trading a marcelo meyer or any of the top three guys for something for this team you know what i mean let's Let's give our minor league system another year to mature. We'll see. Hopefully we have, you know, that's very important. Everybody stays healthy and, and kind of continues to improve and it continues to make your farm system look better. Um, but it's just, if you're not going to spend on this team, I don't see why you would ever trade away prospects. You know, it's sort of like, you know, 2017, you bring in David Price, you know, you bring in Kimbrell, you start building this thing and you're like, okay, now that we've spent on this team, we need to make that big splash and that big trade. And here comes the Chris Sale trade, right? And you bring him in or 16, 17, whatever that timeline was. So I think they're tied into one another. Um, if once you start spending, I think is when you start trading some of your guys and really believe in your team can win. Another guy that I feel like ties in directly with allowing you to trade, like us, obviously you trade when you have surplus and a guy yeah. that 
that his break, this guy's breakout could potentially lead to that surplus to sit on Rafael. And we've obviously seen what we've seen from him this spring, but obviously his development in center field changes the potential path for Darren Duran. Maybe it changes the potential path for Roman Anthony. What, what have you liked from him so far this spring? And do you think that he should be opening day center fielder? You know, if someone tells me that like, you know, it's all up to his swing decisions because we know how good of a player he is and chase rate and everything else. I would say that he's passed the test. Like, what are we doing? You know, like I watch this guy all the time. Does he swing and miss at some stuff? Yeah. But everyone does. I mean, it's the big leagues. Like you, Tristan Casas has got one of the best eyes in baseball. Does he have a chase, a pitch? Of course he does. So to me, it's like, I, you know, enough people I've talked to about him. They're like, you know, like it's all, it's like, it's time. Like let the kid go out there and play. You know, I know big leagues at a different level and, and they will scout them. They will, you know, and sometimes you can get in a little bit of quicksand, you know, teams get scouting reports and they just keep coming after you and you start kind of losing confidence. That's what you got to look out for. But um, the way I look at it, he's in center field, you know, Duran's in left field. And then you start going to Brady O'Neill on right field. And defensively, I think you're a hell of a lot better than you were. What does that mean about Roman Anthony? Like, I, I can't worry about that right now. Like, I can't worry about Meyer and Anthony and Teal. I can't. I just can't because it's like you start worrying about the big league team, which is where the focus should be on. So, um, but I, I, you know, you're looking at this team. It's like you find out who Rafaela is. Give him a whole year. You know, maybe you found some. And then, you know, then you look at it and say, okay, now you start going out and figuring out the value. Maybe if Anthony is ready, you start shopping. Hell, you start shopping all three. You know, Abreu, Rafaela, Duran. And you try to see what the return is. No matter who you like, you just listen to offers. You might get a monster back. Somebody might like one of those three better than the others. And you're just trying to fit a hole here, find a hole for, for Anthony, because I think you can play all three. Yeah, and just, just back to Rafael, I just find it so interesting watching him this spring. And like like you said, it does – like the eye test, he passes it. He looks yeah. like he's improved. And the, the swing or the chase rate is 10% better or so. He was around 40% last year. And you, know, you look at the savant pages of some of these guys and – you know, Javi Baez is around like the 40% mark and he's like the worst of the worst. Then you got Devers who does damage, but obviously chases. He's around the 25th percent. But it's like, which, which players are you going to be closer to? If he's at the Devers range and he's playing great defense and you know, he's got some maybe 20 homer pop, 15 to 20 homer pop, like, oh my God, he's a stud. If he's chasing 40%, then that's when, that's when you need to dig deeper and work with the guy out of that. But it feels like he might be past that, which is why I'm so excited. And like, I was, I was one of, I don't want to say I was a doubter, but I was not sold. Certainly not at the start of spring training if, with him being the starting center fielder. And I mm-hmm. am right now. Yeah, no, I, I, from, I think from the very beginning, it was like, just what are we doing? Like, just see, let's create just some depth. You know what I mean? Let's put Duran in center and O'Neill in left and Abreu in right and Ref Schneider kind of out there. Your sheet can play a little bit. And, and you send Rafaela down, you give him a month kind of extended spring training. Right. Like it's triple A. Who cares? Go down there and just find it. And because inevitably someone's going to get hurt. Right. Durant got hurt last year a little bit. O'Neill kind of gets hurt, you know, the last few years in his career. Brayu as well in the minor league. So eventually he's going to be up. Right. So, but the way I look at it now, Ref Snyder's down and I'm, you, you just, you watch this kid. And, and by the way, he's, I think he's, you know, I don't know, he's around 260, 270, you know, um, right now hitting, but it's a quality of at bat. It's, it's swinging at strikes. It's, it's, you know, good contact, you know, even lining out the third base. That's a positive in spring training, especially for him. So I'm encouraged by it. You know, what's the worst that can happen? You know, I mean, you put him out there and if he, if he starts to lose some confidence, if it starts to snowball him, you have enough depth to send him down for a little bit, catch his breath and move on. So moving on to a different name, Trevor Story, yeah. huge, gigantic X factor for this team, defense, offense, we need to see it. I want to hear what are your expectations for Story in 2024? Yeah, he, he looks a lot better to me right now. You know, and I look at that last year in Colorado. I think it was like 251, 27 homers in that range. Um, I think you'll take that all day long. I know that average, maybe you want to get up a little bit more, but it's all about the damage. It, there's always going to be swing and miss in his game. Um, he's going to strike out. He's going to chase. But when he does make contact, you want it hard contact at damage. You know, if he strikes out a buck 40, buck 50 times, like he's done that before. But if he does that while hitting 268 with 27 home runs and 90 RBIs, I'm in, you know, because I know he's going to steal 20 plus. I know he's going to play gold glove defense. There's plenty of value there, but he just looks more comfortable. Like it's, 
this is a hard city. It gets really loud when you show up and everybody knows you're replacing a favorite in Xander Bogart. Yeah. And you, you show up late because you signed late. The minute you show up, you know, you, you have your ba- have a baby. So now you leave camp. And then he was sick for a while. He missed time. And then he got hurt. And then he got hot. And then he got hurt. And then we know what happened last year. He, he came back because they needed defense at short. And he provided it. But there was no chance in hell he was ready offensively. And, right. and I think people made a mistake of saying that's who he is. It's not who he is. Um, but he's got to be a lot better. And I think he will be this year. Uh, obviously, staying healthy is a big part of it, but he's a good player, and you're right. I mean, if he's going to be good, your offense is going to be good. If not, yeah. you're trying to find out who can hit between those two guys, and that could hurt. Right, and also another factor with Story, well, two actually. First of all, the beard is incredible. That's a, that's a <laughs> beard of a leader, yeah. uh, which transitions me into it seems from the outside that he's become kind of a, a vocal leader on this team, which personally I didn't expect. He always came across to me as a kind of a, a silent leader, but – more and more uh, from the outside, we're seeing him take on that role. Uh, is that something you've seen? Is that a, a positive? <laughs> we're not used to those lately, but is that a positive we could take away from Story? Yeah, and I think it goes back to that infield camp, right? I mean, I think he looks around, he sees a lot of the kids. You know, it's just young kids, you know, especially in the middle of the infield with him. And um, and even Devers, you know, is a is, is younger player, but he's still now, he's now a veteran. But I just think he sees the youth around him. I think that's part of who he is. Um, I think it's a good thing. I do think he's a leader on that team. So, but the tough part, when you ask him to be a leader, you know, for this team, I I think it can happen, but he's really worked on his own stuff. You know what I mean? He's trying to find his stuff. And that, that's why I think it's, it's a lot to ask. Like, cause he's, this is going to be pressure on him in that first road trip. This is going to be pressure on him in that first homestand. Like, he knows what's going on the last couple of years. He knows what the expectations are. And it's kind of hard to be like, listen, i got my own shit going on. I can't help you right now. You know, let me get settled in. Let me get – and I think if he can get hot, I think if he can have a good start, I think that's obviously, yeah. you know, a good thing for him. It can kind of help the whole team. It's, it's a massive amount of pressure. You got him probably batting third. You're yep. anchoring the infield defense. And, oh, mm-hmm. by the way – please lead these young guys. So man, yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's the no brainer X factor for this team. He's talented player. We just haven't seen it yet. So let's hope. So following up on optimism uh, and talking about the road trip, we had Joe Weil on a week or two ago and he's, he's very go happy, happy, go lucky. I think a little bit better than most people. Uh, I think that's just a product (laughs) of him being a nerd and loving baseball. And I love him for that. Uh, But he kind of, he, he sold me a bit on something where the Red Sox are starting off the season on a crappy road trip, but they're also not playing the toughest teams in the world. And then they come back home and they're still not playing the toughest teams in the world. How important do you think? And not just like, of course it's important to get going right away. I mean, look at the Bruins. They had a hot start and they've really kind of just been mediocre the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. And that beginning helped them get points right off the bat. But do you think more than ever that this team is experiencing a we have to start off hot or it's basically a dead season? And how deep into the year do you think that like what after the first month of baseball, let's say 30 games, what do you think their record could be to stay contenders or and what do you think that it will be? Yeah, I think that's more of like us media stuff. Like I don't think the guys in the team sit and say we come back four and six seasons over. You know what yeah. I mean? The baseball players, they play 162 games. They fully understand, you know, what it's like for the whole season. But, you know, first off, I don't – I never like playing bad teams um, early in the season at all. Trap. I'd rather play the absolute iron. I'd rather play the best teams in baseball. And and because somebody always slips early in the year, and you beat a really good team early on, and then later on when they're a juggernaut, you don't want anything to do with them. So – and it's the same thing for bad teams. Like the Oakland A's right now, they got a bunch of young kids in there and they think they can win 95 games, you know, and you catch them early on and all of a sudden they're on fire and they believe in themselves. You want to play them in July and August when there's an injury or two and then the reality sets in and they're no good. So I, I, you know, I'm not crazy about playing Oakland and Anaheim, you know, this much early on. I'd rather play them later in the year when I think reality sets in. So, you know, it's kind of like Pittsburgh last year. they, They were a lot better maybe for longer than we thought, but, when you rather play Pittsburgh in August than you did in April, like that was a completely different ball club. So um, first month, you know, it depends on everybody else. You're talking about like Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay 
had an unbelievable April for three months, played 500 baseball, and they still had a big lead, you know, at the time. So it, it's very, it's important. I think it's important to get W's. What's really going to be important is when you're leading after five, six innings to get W's. And that's why, you know, Martin and Jansen, like they were so good last year. I mean, they won 78 games last year and they, you know, they were really, really good. You, you can't have a couple games on this first Rome stand and give them up in the eighth or ninth. Like you just, you're not that good to overcome that. So, well, it's a good thing we didn't trade anyone that we brought in in the eighth and ninth last year. That was yeah. pretty good for us, you know. That's what <laughs> well, I mean. John Schreiber. Positive. Let me do a positive spin. Yeah. <laughs> this is a reach. They're getting the West Coast trip out of the way early. Yeah. So it's done with. There we go. I think that's fair. I think fair point, dude. They, what do they have? They have one more of those right after this? The entire rest of the year, they get one yeah. more West Coast trip? I don't yeah, think that's nothing. I yeah, think, like, I, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of it, and I know that's a good theory because I, I kind of feel it's you know sometimes it's like you get it out of the way, you don't have to worry about going back out there. They go to L.A., Colorado, that's it after the All Star break. So the problem is, I don't know you guys watched that Breakout Stars game that we did. The um, I know actually the, the night game uh, against the Twins, I think it was a 6:05 start, and yeah, at about 8:30 or so, I think we interviewed like Tech. And we were talking about Andrew Bailey, and we showed Andrew Bailey in the dugout, and he was yawning. Ugh. And then we showed Tech, and he was yawning. And my reaction was, it's 8.30. The first pitch is an hour and a half away. Yeah, I heard you say that. Oh, God. That's like, terrible. There's, there's and, goes and, my spin. <laughs> and that's the reality. Like, I know they have all these sleep doctors and everything else, but, you know, I'm going to go to Seattle after being down here for 10 days and just living my life, whatever, and I'm going to get up at 4.30 in the morning wondering what am I going to do until seven o'clock at night, you know, and most of these guys, I'd say get to the ballpark around five thirty six in the morning on the East coast and, and, you know, get up at five thirty, and by 10 o'clock, they're probably in bed because they know they're getting up at five thirty. So it's why they're playing a lot more night games to try to help with that. But that's the biggest challenge is kind of getting there at 10 because they all play in night games, which makes no sense, but whatever. And these guys at 10 o'clock, getting loose at quarter of are going to be like, whoo, no more greenies boys. You know, we can't do <laughs> those. That hey, shit. good days. I'm back sure those day. were good days. Back in the day, we pop a greenie. We're ready to go. I'll play till 4 a.m. But you can't do that. <laughs> Lou, I got something for you to do in Seattle. You ever had a uh, Seattle dog? I don't think I have. Okay. Bear Talk. with me. Yeah. Sound, sounds a little weird, but I've had one. They're good. It's a regular hot dog yep. with cream cheese on the inside like smeared on the inside of the bun and then like sauteed grilled onions it sounds gross it's unbelievable look at coop's face it's unbelievable i promise in a in a mm. kind of trashy way cream when i'm a cream cheese, cheese guy <laughs> you know it sounds more like a sausage right with the onions on top yeah i think i think they do both that you can do like a sausage variant or hot dog but it's I'll good chicago, right. chicago dog's the best you yes, yes. That. I won't put it over Chicago dog, but it's still very for, good. For like dinner, it'd be like 5 30, 8 30 to my body. And maybe it'll keep me awake all night. Yeah. It'll be so much coffee, like dude. Night. I'm going to be so beaned up doing these games. I'll be screaming and yelling 17 cups of coffee into it. <laughs> Eating up. It's a new one. Yeah. Sammy, was that the hot dog? We had we had a conversation last year about some whack ass hot dog. Was that? I had the weirdest that, hot dog. I Cleveland did a um I went no, to the ALDS game uh in Cleveland that the Yankees got walked off. And uh I had a hot dog oh, that good. had Fruit Loops and uh, yeah. mac and cheese and pimento oh, cheese no. on it. What? It was wild. Yes. That, it was good though. Was like I, I can't hate on it. It was good. <laughs> Finished it. <laughs> stomach my stomach definitely felt it, but it, it was yeah, it was tasty. I'm sure. It's like all your daily sugar and calories in one go. Yeah. Uh, quick question though, Lou. On yeah. you brought up the the spring breakout game, which you called, uh, and we were talking a little bit about prospects. And just because that's fresh off of everyone's like memory, and it, it's an awesome thing. We were saying before we even got in here, it's an awesome thing to see because a, yeah. the Red Sox are at the point where you have to show off this talent. But even outside of if they were a competitive team this year, like like. The Braves even held it, and the, you get to see really great talent in the Braves organization, and that's something that I think should be more prevalent in baseball, and fans can learn about. Uh, but you also, in our circumstance here, we got to see people that we were excited about, about Miguel Blaze, today and Rafaela, and we also got to see some guys show up that we maybe didn't expect to show up, and I'm curious who stood out in all of that that you weren't really expecting to stand out. Um. 
So, you know, we've seen Anthony a few times, and obviously he's a man child, and I know old Meyer is too. He's just, like I said, just got to stay healthy. It was fun just to be around Kyle Teal um, and just talk to him a little bit more. But um, I think he's kind of like a very, you know, mature player. His game is very mature. You mentioned a guy like Miguel Blaise. I, I, you know, I, I've watched him now for a couple of years, and he's bigger now physically. I was really hoping that a couple guys were going to be in this game, and Cespedes, you went to Cespedes down in the Dominican um, Republic League, and 18 years old, you know, Latin player of the year. I, he didn't play because he had a little something going on. It's nothing real serious. They just want to give him an extra day off. I saw him take BP, and it was just – just shouldn't look like that at 18. You know, for really? Right hitting rockets off the wall and strong kid. Um, I really wanted to see the kid. Uh, was it Sanatello? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this kid probably put about 15 pounds on and he is thick. I think maybe he got taller. By the way, I heard Roman Anthony's now six, four. Um, what? Yeah. What? Six, what? Still growing? He hit second puberty? He's 19. He's of course he's still growing. He's 19, but I did hear he's six, four now and not so six, unfair. two. So, but Zanatello is another one that you put Zanatello and you put Meyer and you put Anthony together. I saw them, three of them hitting in a cage and it was just lightning. I mean, it was, and I couldn't get over this kid because he's 18, just drafted and really more like this great athlete. And now he's big and strong. So that was fun. I thought Richard Fist looked really good. 97. I don't think anybody really seen that in a while. I heard yeah. he been up. And Sandlin, who didn't throw in this game, well, I would have liked to have heard, seen the one for your boy Shriver. Um, I heard he's like legit 98, 99. Like he yeah. is, he, again, wow. another guy that was, Velo is tick way up as well. So they, they've got some good players. And Breslow's brought in a couple of those arms and fits in uh, Salem because they need starters. Um, it's just a lot of fun. Like, I loved it. Like, I like I like seeing guys I've never seen before. Put You know, the, the face with the name, you know, uh, that's what I like about Cam. Hmm. Is this it? Is this who they're going to? I have to ask. I feel like I'm obligated. Is this who they're going to go into the season with? Like, is there any help coming? No Montgomery, Lorenzen? I don't know what the hell Montgomery's doing at this point. And I don't know what the hell the Red Sox are doing at this point. But to me, there's really no excuse for him not to be here two months ago. Uh, I don't think anybody in baseball doesn't understand why he's not here. Like, he's not a – there's a reason why everybody thought he was going to come here. It's because he's the perfect fit here. You know, it's like the Orioles needed Corbin Burns, right? They They – they have Bradish and Grayson. They, they've got guys, you know, and the Yankees have Cole. And, sure, they could use somebody else there as well, I think, personally. They're a little thin now, that he, especially if he's down. Mm-hmm. So you look around the league and you're like, this, but you're the team that needed somebody that goes 32 starts, 175 innings, competes, stays healthy, gives you innings. Like, you're the team that needed that. You're the team that needs Jordan Montgomery. And, and, and you've got a core here of young players. You've got, you know, high affiliate, double A, triple A prospects. Like you're actually ready to start supplementing this young group of Wong and potentially Teal, of Casas, of Grissom, of Story, of Devers, of Duran, of Rafael, of Abreu. Like it, it's here right now. And mm-hmm. that's why it's frustrating. That's why it doesn't make sense. I don't think it's over because, you know, I refuse to believe it. Um, but we'll see. We'll see where he ends up Odd, buying. Odds uh, Scott Boris gets fired because this is wild. Like, I like, how does a player not get mad at his yeah, agent? At this point? Yeah. Well. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, he's got a track record. Obviously, he's taking the L this offseason. Yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, is he going to lose players? I think his track record is still, you know, is there, it's still be, the Scott uh, Boris name. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it could be an adjustment with how he sees where the game is going and what teams are doing now. I have no idea, but. Um, I still think I don't think he's gonna lose too many people because he's his track record. He still gets a ton of cash, and he's still one of the he's still the best agent in the game. It's just that he's losing right now with these guys. I uh, do Louis wonder Sipper. if it's. I, hold on, I I wonder, and th- maybe this is just me being hopelessly optimistic that the baseball off seasons will be better. I know that salary cap in, in Major League Baseball is a big reason why these off seasons aren't gonna go like you see him with and the mm-hmm. NBA and the NFL. But part of it's out that some of these agents see a guy like Aaron Nola jump on a contract quick. He signs for 170 plus million. And who knows if that deal is there for him, if he was made, I don't know. Do you think there's any hope that this wacky off season could potentially lead to something better in the future? Or are we just going to keep getting more of the same? 
I, I, unfortunately, I think it's a lot of the same. You know, um, the question is, what does free agency look like in like five years from now? You know, 10 years from now? Because uh, all the good players are signing extensions. Like that's the new wave. Yeah. Right. So when you look at free agencies and, and you know, it's funny because this offseason, it was like, you know, Yamamoto and Snell and, and Montgomery and Gray. And they're like, yeah, this isn't the good free agency. Next year it is. I'm like, what are we talking? What, what, yeah. What's so what do you mean next year? Like that. next year's crop's not going to be as good as the one we're seeing right now. I refuse to believe that. I think, you know, Corbin Burns may be out there. Um, but if I'm the Orioles, I'm, I'm bringing him back. Why did I make that trade? Like, you know, I'm going to extend him. Like, you know, so a lot of these guys are going to sign extensions. You know, a lot of these, and, and then a lot of the guys in free agency are either 40 years old or coming off serious injury. Like Walker Bueller could be out there. Let's see if he can stay healthy. Shane Bieber could be out there. Let's see if he's throwing 90 or 94. We have no idea what he's going to look like. So, um, this is a good crop. Uh, I think that, like I said, you just like, I mean, all these 10 year deals keep popping up five years from now. Will there be free agents? Will there be 38 year old free agents like sitting out there because everyone else is already tied up? So, what does that mean for the CBA in 2026? Because that's coming up. And I had originally thought, you know, you see Shohei Otani come in. And what he did with his contract, I can't imagine other owners being too happy that the Dodgers did that because a, it sets a precedent that other players will want to do if they want, like Mike Trout could easily do that. I or not really easily, but he could do mm-hmm. that if he wants with another team or another yep. pitcher. Um, and then B, it also sets a precedent that, and I like, I more so think about it this way. If the Guggenheim group ever pulls out of LA, you know, who gets left holding that bill? for Shohei Otani and it's the next owner, but it also becomes more difficult for someone else to like buy out the Dodgers. So it's kind of like, do you hear any of this rumblings or are there any questions about the next CBA? And as far as what free agency is doing right now for it? No, I know a lot of people trying to throw out ideas of how to try to speed it up. You know, the whole like, Hey, December 15th, if you wait, you can't sign more than a five year deal. Right. And I'm sure owners, We'll present it that way, and they'll probably push for it because that's just another way for them. Like me, it's just me thinking of a player. I mean, you play that scenario out, and you know, Aaron Nola seven one seventy four. He's like, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna offer you seven one twenty, and if you don't take it by midnight, sorry, all we can do is give you a four or five year deal. So I think they'll start leveraging stuff like that. You know, so I don't think agents or BPA will ever let that happen, but. The deferred money with Shohei, that's a very unique situation um, because the man makes like $50 million off the field, doesn't give a rat's ass about $2 million from the Dodgers, right? Like he's like, yeah. I'll make $52 million this year in advertising and your salary. Like, And he also understands that World Series adds so much more value. Right. It's the Tom Brady effect. Yeah, but the point is, is like, say like Bobby Witt Jr., you know, he's not going to defer $700 million because he's been making 850 grand. Like, he's like, I want my shit now. Like, I, I, you know, I want my money now and don't give it to me in 10 years. But Joey makes so much cash off the market, you know, off the field that, you know, he don't It's care such an outlier matter. that it won't matter. Such an outlier. Yeah. But I mean, there'll be guys, you know, like they'll, some guys that have made a lot of money in their career, like a guy like Garrett Cole, you know, we'll see what happens with him and. If he hits free agency and he leaves New York, like that's a guy that's made, you know, that hit his one big contract. And when he looks at his second contract, he's already made a ton of money. He might sit there and do something like that. But you, you have to make a lot of money first yep. or off the field to start deferring most of your salary to begin with. So, Lou, you mentioned it a moment ago. You used the word frustrating um, yep. to describe the offseason. I think we will all agree with that. You also mentioned how Montgomery makes sense. And to me, at least, everything that has made sense has not happened. So right. my get question my is, <laughs> all good. is there any of that frustrating sentiment? Is that leaking into the locker room at all? Like, I'm trying to get a vibe check is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think it is. I think you heard it from Devers. I think you've been hearing it from, sorry, uh, Kelly, <laughs> Kelly Jansen. <clears throat> I'm dying over here. Um, <laughs> these guys know, like maybe some of the young kids don't know, but they know, like I've been on teams and you, 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 you know, you play in the big leagues and like you go through 162 games, you show up at spring training, you look around and you know, like what you need and you know, you need more than, you know, 
two two guys in Bayo and Pavetta, and then the other five still trying to find their way as starters in this league. And meaning like Crawford, Whitlock, Hauk, you know, Winkowski, I'm throwing him in there. He's in the bullpen. Cooper Criswell, like, you know, like he's in the mix somehow too, right? So, like, they know. They walk in here and they're like, especially guys that just lived through it. You know, like, remember the whole seven-man rotation you had last year coming out of camp? And, oh, my God, what are we going to do? But, and, and you know, you had some depth down in Triple H. And none of those guys really panned out as starters and Walter and Murphy and Mata and everybody. So, like, they know that right now they're very, very thin. And when the Giolito injury happened, they're like, well, there goes 180 innings. Hopefully they're going to be quality. So I think, you know, you're always optimistic. They also look around the clubhouse and see they have a lot of really good players. You know, they really do. Just like last year's team had a lot of really good players, but you cannot go through a season with two openers out of a five-man rotation for a month and a half like they did. You, yeah. you can't do it. That's what makes it so crazy. We just saw how detrimental that can be, and it just it, it feels like we're going to see it again, maybe even quicker. I feel like they got like a, a three-man rotation at this point. It's just nothing that makes so, sense happen. Yeah. So much of it, and like, yeah, we we say it every year that oh, if they stay healthy, last year, like you said, Lou, they come out with a seven man rotation, and you don't even think they need to stay perfectly healthy, and yet they still by midsummer are down to a three man rotation. Um, we're gonna get out of here after one last question. I just want to give you the chance. There's been a lot of standouts this spring, and and one guy that has definitely caught my eye is Connor Wong. Yeah. He's up over 400, up over an 1,100 OPS. Like, just looks like a lot more comfortable at the plate. Who, who's the guy that you don't think is getting talked about right now that should be getting a little bit more hype as we get towards the season? Could it, I don't know, maybe a reliever, maybe a bet that, like, we, we get so engulfed in, like, especially with, with the uh, with the spring breakout game. We're, we're so excited to see some of these guys, but – in some games, like there's got, there's been guys who are hitting the ball well. Yeah, the, and Connor would definitely have been the, my choice, you know, um, because of how you know he's made a few adjustments too. He's on the plate a little bit more, closer to the plate. He's moved his hands a little bit. He just feels more relaxed. He got rid of the toe tap. He's really simplified it, um, and you know he hasn't really swung and missed that much, which is a huge problem with him last year. So he's and I tell you, he's a guy that for years now, a lot of people that have had him in the minor leagues. Or like, you know, if he's not an everyday guy that could pop 20 home runs, then we've messed him up. So um, maybe he's starting to find that stride. You know, we'll see. I think there's been a lot of really good arms, you know. Um, the kid Hageman, like, like he's not even on the 40-man roster. Like, he has looked fantastic. Like, Slayton has looked really good. You know, Cora today was talking about the lefty, you know, race in that bullpen, and, and he kept – or it's like Bernardino, it's Murphy, it's Litkey. And he brought up a couple names in like a kid Boozer who was like 98, 99 from the left side. And the kid who threw today, Benitez. Now he's only double A arm, but he has been fantastic too. So it's it's a lot of the guys you want, like on a big league team, you know, whether it's Duran now, I think, getting hot and Abreu starting to turn a corner too, because he had a bad start. Yeah. Rafaela. Really, O'Neill is a guy that's impressed me a lot. You just gotta get him healthy. Like he I I've really been impressed with his swing, his defense, just overall, like just aura around him here in camp. Like he's, he's really good to have around, but there's just been too much injury with him. And hopefully that calf, we see him in that lineup on Tuesday. Cause if not, as Cora said, then you start to get a little bit worried. Lou, we appreciate you coming on, man. We're, All right, boys. we're in the fourth four for the rest of the way, right? We'll see you there. What's that? You're in the fourth the rest of the way. Yeah, I'm here. I got uh Tuesday's game on Nesson. And then like four games on radio, and then I do radio um, the exhibition games in Texas, and I'll do radio with Will Fleming in Seattle and Oakland. I'll have the Anaheim series off because I do Nesson for the first six games on the homestand. So, a little back back and forth. It'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Sweet. Start it. the season. Well, yeah. yeah. Sammy yeah. and I will be down on uh we'll be down Thursday. We get there, so we'll see you when we're there. Yeah, I'll be here this weekend. We got uh, busy, what, Saturday's a night game, Sunday the day game, then we fly out. Friday's actually yeah. in Dunedin. That's like, a, I think it's in Dunedin. That's a bitch. That's just a long trip. Oof. It is what they it gotta, is. They got to do the Cactus League method, just consolidate oh, everything. I had spring training out in Arizona like three years. It was having 20-minute rides everywhere. People That's bitch about this one trip. It was a surprise. It's like an hour and a half. 
I'm like, that's like a short trip in Florida. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Also, but, Scottsdale yeah. is just Scottsdale and like Phoenix rock. Scottsdale, Underrated Phoenix, cities. Mesa. I mean, it's all right there. Like everybody just plays in one area, and it's oh. fantastic. And the Mexican it's a beautiful time of year up there too. Big thanks to Lou Merloni for jumping on and making his play Tessie debut. Hopefully the first of many appearances for Lou on this podcast. Lou is the best, and I know you, you guys had as good a time as I did, but what would you guys think? Takeaways from the interview? Coop, Sammy, Pat's here now. Pat fixed He's his Knuff. laptop, so Pat's here. He is Knuff. He is here. He's here. But I thought that was an awesome interview. Yeah, no, I think we, like, as we said at the beginning, like it, it, that was a preview of the season. I, if you had any other questions about this season after that interview, you didn't pay attention. That's all I'll say. Cause that was fantastic. Lou gave us a ton of time in the world. Uh, guy rocks. I, I can't wait to listen to him more. I was just saying to the boys off camera that the coolest thing about Lou is that he gives a shit about the Red Sox. Like if they're bad, he's upset about it. If they're good, He's happy about it. So he's kind of like us in that way, um, except we didn't play Major League Baseball. But uh, great interview nonetheless. There's few people I like listening talk socks more than Lou Merloni. So glad we got to do that. Glad he that's, never forgets his roots. That's something we're going to have to follow up on him about. Like, I just want to talk to him about playing for the Red Sox as a kid growing up in Boston. I shouldn't say yeah. in Boston, but in the Boston area. Like, that's... He's got a cool like backstory that I think a lot of people would be interested in hearing. Like that, like, Lou's just the dude. He just True. yeah, we'll ask him that. I feel like that wouldn't have. Like, like, we got to yeah. do like three. So we'll, if the season we'll get... goes south, we save that. Yeah, we gotta, all right. You know. so, yeah, pay no attention to the season. What was it like playing for the Boston Red Sox? Yeah. We got to experience more. it up. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well done. Any? Uh, should we just jump into some enough said? Anyone got anything going? Sammy, you got something? Yeah, I got one I want to share. Bear with me. I gotta pull this up. So uh, obviously St. Patty's Day today, March 17th, as we're recording, and a lot of green around town. So I, I brought back this old idea I had. Uh, I, I kind of bring this up every year. Before I present the idea, I have to preface this with, I'm not a huge fan of the City Connect jerseys. I understand what they stand for. I love that. Marathon Monday. I can't, I don't like the colors. It doesn't look Red Sox. The font on the jersey doesn't match the font on the hat. I can't get into it. Not my thing. So a better idea, in my opinion, would be to bring back the jerseys that the Red Sox wore. I believe it was in 2009 to celebrate the Celtics winning the championship in 2008. And it's basically like, it's basically the St. Paddy's Day green Red Sox jersey. So my idea is bring those back instead of the blue and yellow City Connect rebrand them as like the green monster jerseys or like the Wally jerseys, something. I just think the green and red is so much more Boston Red Sox than looking like a peep with the blue and the yellow. And you also kind of look like UCLA. So that's my enough said. I want a different city connect. The green I think is sick at Fenway Park. What do you guys think? I no, I, mean, I agree with you, Sammy. And I think, I, mean, I think, other teams change it up, right? Like they wouldn't be the first team to get a different city connect, right? Yeah, I think the Dodgers are changing theirs up. Um, Come on, you can change it up. The NBA teams get new shit every single year. Like, why not? Yeah, I saw. Like oh, Sam, you love this. I'm gonna have to find what my buddy sent me. It was months ago, so it's gonna be impossible. But it was this incredible idea for a Red Sox city connect jersey. And it was like green monster green. And it had all these like little odes to the city on it that were like subtle, but tasteful. It was awesome. Oh, was that the one that had like the freedom trail brick path oh, around the, uh, the sleeve? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's, that's so these cute. jerseys rock so look? hard though. How, and there's, there's no so other team with those colors, green and red. There's no team that does that. It's unique to the Red Sox and it looks like the Red Sox. And I don't want to keep trashing the city connect. I, I'm very no, much. Trash them. I don't love them. I, I'm very much in the minority. I'm aware of that. They're not bad. They're just not my favorite. So I, I think this is infinitely cooler with the red trim around the yeah. lettering too. Ooh. Ooh. I love it. Do I see some Hideo Kojima in that picture you just pulled up, Coop? Yeah, Hideo that's a red glove. That's yeah. a Hideo Kojima. Hell okay. yeah. I mean, I, I should be pointing out Manny. I should point out man at everywhere I can. Dude's my You know babe, who I but... see? And then okay, I see man. noted baseball lover JD Drew. 
Hinsky. Oh yeah. Too. Your boy. Did we bring up Hinsky last episode? Is that Hinsky? He was. We yeah we brought up Hinsky because he was one of those guys that was awesome and then just kind of tailed off for no reason. Dude, look at that. That looks so good. Not the not the spring training one. Not the, the white spring training ones. ones. The spring training yeah. ones suck. But I didn't like the the white on the side. But yeah, that, those look at that. Sick. That's sick. I'm all in. Nope, nope. I'm not pulling out that picture. I want to hear what like what listeners have to say about this because I feel strongly. I think they should do this. Yeah, Greens never should have left. Mm-hmm. Leave it in the comments. What's on yeah. the green jerseys? Would you bring them back? Would you sacrifice? The yellow ones to get the green ones back. Would you make that transaction? Leave it in the comments. But that's, yes. but that's the rule. That's the rule. You got to get rid of the yellows. Can't have both. One or the other to make it. So yeah, would, you sacri- would you would you sacrifice the city connects for the green? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. I would. It's like the gotta give to get. You gotta the, give to get coop. It's one of the infinity stones. Like you gotta swap a soul for a soul. That's what I'm saying, bro. Swap a soul. Coop, you got enough said? Uh, yeah, I guess I went to the new, uh, mighty squirrel brewery over on f- the David Ortiz drive, whatever it's named by Fenway. They opened up this past week, uh, going to be the spot for the summer. It's fantastic. Ooh. A ton of sunlight bay doors that open up a uh, ton of beer selection, ton of, I, I had some tasty non alkies for those that don't drink beer or be in the DD, uh, very tasty, ton of good food, giant pizza ovens. Uh, so a mighty squirrel sponsor us. Cause we will, we'll ride the hell out of you. The, uh, it was awesome. Right, I'm taking pause. you boys. Uh, buddy, is that I'll, near, uh, I'll ride the hell out near, of them. I don't care. Is that near Trillium? Uh, yeah, but yeah. it's not as Trillium's not as cool. Trillium. You got to walk far. It's bad. Trillium's good. Trillium is like, it's, it's good, but it's also like if in terms of Fenway, like if you're thinking about like a pregame spot, it feels like it's like just barely no this beats it you know where you, you know be. where locos is no it's the yeah. taco place like right across from fenway where the ticket office is i know where the ticket yeah. office is Isn't it's it, where oh, we is filmed near- our little special for announcing the podcast if you have oh, okay. go check out yeah. the socials uh it's like right Hell down yeah. the street from that it's right next to the climbing gym shout out but yeah, go there. It rocks. That's my enough said. I, uh, nothing else. Uh, the lines were super long though because it was St. Patrick's Day. But yeah, it was still fast moving. Yeah. Who could have seen that coming? Mm. Not your fault. No. John Taffer would be losing that... his shit. John Taffer. <laughs> you ever heard of the? Uh, what is it? He calls it like the. So he basically for every time he makes a dance floor, he makes it so like the way you get in is really narrow. So you bump into people and there's like a psychological psychological component where if you accidentally bump someone, you're more likely to be like, oh, sorry. Hey, would you like to dance? Weird. I, that's what I That's bizarre on. as hell. I, I'll i go with it because he's never wrong. I mean, it's John Taffer. He's the bar well, he's, rescuer. Well, Coop, he yells really loud. So he has to be right. Mm. He is. That's how politics work. Pat, you got one? You got enough said? I do. I do actually. Uh, mine's a story from last night. I went to uh, Patty Berry's in Quincy. Uh, the bartender played a great joke on me. She put she put some alcohol on all those beers I was drinking. Classic. Mm. And uh, there was a guy behind me. And I, Coop, I know you do. Gordo and Sammy, I don't know about you. You guys watch? I think you should leave. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Okay, so there's a guy behind me. And, and, scally cap we're the only two guys in the bar the scally cap so already i'm like i fu- i fuck with this guy i hear him go you think this is pushback this is slick back and i go oh i'm all the way in so i turn around and i go fuck you bart harley jarvis he goes this guy gets it we were walking <laughs> by each other the entire night in in passing was just a different i think you should leave quote it, it must have been going on 20 and at the end of the night he came up when he was leaving and he goes dude i appreciate you i had so much fucking fun tonight and he gave me a hug and he left and it was the most wholesome experience i've ever had in a bar dude's rock dude's, dude's rock, rock dude. dude's rock oh my god look at my light you see this yeah i do yeah yeah, yeah. wait do you also Pat. want to talk about what else happened at the bar yeah i was just about to say tell this i need, I need some elaboration on this joe kelly thing that you texted us oh yeah so 
it was like friends of friends and they were like oh like you're the one that does like the podcast right i was like yeah yeah and uh they were like you don't know joe kelly do you and i was like well i was like i'm we're all friends with a guy who he wrote the book with he's they were like dude I would go lay down in traffic for Joe Kelly. I fucking love that guy. And I was like, all right. <laughs> I was like, all right. It's like, hey, uh, okay. I guess but you yeah. won some World Series. Yeah, it was like six degrees of separation from me to Joe Kelly. And they were in their response was, I will die for Joe Kelly. I'll lay <laughs> I'll lay in front of an 18 wheeler for Joe. And I'm like, all right. All right, sweet. Sounds good, man. Would you Sammy buy a shirt on the five? dark side? Yeah. Cheers. I can't deal with the. I can't deal with this. Fucking yeah, dude, life. you were you were I you were hurting my eyes there. Yeah, how do you think I feel? I'm. I will say that. though, your <laughs> eyes are piercing blue right now. They are beautiful. Yeah, your face, your face is lighting up with the computer light. Yeah, oh, looking good, man. Uh, my my nuts is just a quick one. Patty's parade in Southie is it's awesome. Like no, it's not. Yeah, call call me a degenerate for going to the St. Patty's Day Parade in Southie. I I think it's a lot of fun. It's basically just a bunch of trucks with people throwing out necklaces and candy, and some guy threw me a bag of chips and I ate some Lay's. Like it's a good time. I had fun. It is. I've been a couple times now. What the? I'll get out ahead of this one before you guys say it. I think I'm too old for that shit. I can't. I can't. I can't hang. All I can it's do never is never fun. Fingers. It's never fun to sit in lines and just see people throw up all over the place. That's not fun. No, that's fun. No, it's Sammy, not. Sammy, Sammy, I agree. Sammy might be too old for it though. Yeah. Sammy, you know what I did? This time you know how I celebrated St. My... Patty's Day? I did like board games and watched like anime with my girlfriend. That fun. sounds fun. Hell yeah. That sounds yeah. Fun. Hell yeah, brother. Uh I actually can I get can I get a enough said part two? Go for it. Hell yeah. for, if we're doing this whole St. Patrick's Day thing, boiled dinner sucks. Boiled dinner is like the worst thing to ever exist. Oh, uh, it, it's, I, I agree. It. I grew up, I, I'm Irish. I, I grew up with my mom making boiled dinner. Uh, not just at St. Patrick's is, Day, but like she would make, oh, it's sir. Like I don't even Irish. know what this is. Boiled dinner? It is, so it's corned beef, uh, cabbage, and potatoes. And it's just like boiled in a water, sometimes chicken stock or a different type of stock um it's i i love uh, mama l if you're listening i love you cooking you you make great food i fucking hate boiled dinner it's the <laughs> worst thing in the world it's based on a tradition that the irish were suffering during the famine which fuck you great britain for that um just pop off on my shit like there real quick and now we're just embracing like crappy tasting food because we were poor once i if the irish could have a mcdouble during the famine i'm sure they would have had it I'm sure they wouldn't have been having boiled dinner. I can tell you that much. Boiled dinner. Why, you, why is it out. called that? Why is because why it's is just it boiled. That? You boil it. It's just I boiled boil meat, pasta. potatoes, and like lettuce. I boil pasta, and I don't call it boiled dinner. Wait, wait, cool. Are you talking shit dinner. on corned beef hash? No, I don't really love okay. corned beef hash either. Oh, I love corn. I'll have like I had a Reuben today. Fire. Like we went out with the family. Reuben's hey, are good. Yeah. Corned beef, corn beef hash is fucking delightful. Hey, Coop, do you know who yeah. Matty Matheson is? Yes, I love okay. him. I just sent you a link. Watch his boiled dinner, and he prefaces, I... he says it like, uh, like, I know everyone hates on this, but like, watch this. Oh, is he going to get some Matty Matheson? Does he see the cookbook? I'm trying to do filler. He probably does. He definitely does. Dude, if you guys like cooking videos, I'm like a huge cooking oh, video content guy. Every time, every time Matty Matheson shows up on my TikTok, I'm in that. I'm just down the rabbit hole for about two hours, just watching every video I hadn't seen. Yeah, it's Maddie, best. sponsor the podcast. I love your cooking. Yes, Hell yes. yeah, <laughs> fucking rocks. If you want to learn how to cook, look up Maddie Matheson. I've been following like he, he, everything I do in like cooking and everything. My sourdough bread inspired by him. Dude rocks. It's punk. Yeah, he's great. And positive vibes, man. We need guys like Matt. We need Matty Matheson to cook the Red Sox their first meal, team meal of the season. Be like, look, I don't know anything about baseball. But here's some food. I grew up in t- Toronto. What the hell do I know about baseball? <laughs> Never even seen a Blue Jay. Did you guys see the video? <laughs> the, the video of him accepting the Golden Globe for the Bear Rocks is yeah. like all time. 
It's like up there with like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck winning the Oscar. Like he just has no idea what he's doing. Just starts yeah. kissing people. He's like, thank you, thank you, the surface industry. Uh, I've never acted before. Uh, he just just yelling whatever's coming in his head. You seen his his toilet pictures? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. His belly's so big he can just take a selfie and nothing. Everything's so covered. <laughs> he's got some of his best cooking videos. He's always done really great stuff. Uh, but he used to do videos with Vice back in like 2017, and uh, they're still out there. And I think it's on their like channel called Munchies or something. But oh, yeah, Cooking if you want to learn to cook in a tiny ass like kitchen or apartment, which if you're living in the Fenway area because you're a Boston Red Sox diehard and you just got to live right by the back, dude, look it up because you will learn so much about cooking, like little like little tips and tricks and everything from Maddie. He's the best. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know where this just, this was a weird enough said. I'm so glad we got to discuss because you talk you talk shit on boiled dinner. I said, yeah, dude, fuck boiled Maddie, dinner. Can you watch the video of him <laughs> making the boiled dinner? Yeah, I or watch it, like every time a video comes out, I watch it. Same. I, I think, religiously I, love. It. I think I've literally seen. Uh, I think this is so embarrassing. I think I've seen every Maddie Matson video on YouTube. I respect the hell out of you for that. I, I learned about him on Hot Ones actually. It's tough. So really, that was yeah. wow. I think that was too early though. Though they, they were 16, no, because Hot Ones is complex. Yeah. Uh, do you ever see the Maury one? No. Now we're just getting way off topic. Super <laughs> early on Hot cool. Ones, they had like very unique guests and they had this producer slash rapper Maury and it's completely off the rails. He brings like tiger blood whiskey and they drink that. It's it's cool. Look it up. What? Yeah. Freaking, yeah. yeah. What's who's... um. I think it was Ja Rule was like, man, good one. He was like, fuck this. I'm going to go reverse. And he tried like the, yep. the hottest one and he like passed out. <laughs> he had to fall asleep. That's the like behind the scenes story. <laughs> Apparently he had to like walk off and he like fell asleep from like the dizziness and the heat. <laughs> wow. What a, what a show. I've tried that hot sauce. It's <clears throat> not great. You can't even consume it. It's ridiculous. Not great. Oh. So the, yeah, the Red Sox. Uh, yeah. Not Sox, great, Sox, but, dude. But yeah, we you know it's baseball. Anything can happen. You know how electric it would be if Tristan Costas went on Hot Ones. <gasps> oh, Pat, God! But this is the that. problem. This is the problem with the Red Sox. They don't have, and I love Costas, love Devers. They don't have anyone even close to a big enough star. Actually, hold on, let me run that back because Anthony Rizzo, the worst Hot Ones guest of all time, by the way, he went on the show. So maybe I'm wrong, but like. Uh I think there's some guys in the bullpen you could bring in there and their personality would show up. Yeah. But it's not like, it's not about that. It's about like attracting viewers. Like who are you going to send in? Like Kenley's your best bet because he's a name. I don't know. I don't know. Like if they got who like big poppy would be a good rep. Perfect. Uh, I don't think so. Cause he'd be trying to like push whatever merch he had between each wing. But But uh, but towards the end, he'd be like, man, but that's what the uh, my um, joints, my joints. My you joints. gotta have them. The show, you gotta have them. Is this for, is though. hot as I fuck. Mean, just like my joint, you gotta have it. But Coop, you you work in in like the world of entertainment. You know nobody's going on that show unless they have something to promote. That's true. That's and he gets true. Little... Uh, hey post post Malone did it super early and he didn't have anything really. Well, his album, but he was more of a vibes <laughs> oh you guy. mean the, the just, his just the album <laughs> whatever. No, he yeah, was more of a his, vibes guy though. If you watch yeah. it, he doesn't really push uh, his album. Yeah, at the, the end he's just like very stony. He just goes, I don't know. Go listen to White Iverson. Wait, I gotta ask. I gotta ask, Gordo. Have you heard of Hot Ones? Yeah, yeah, I know what Hot Ones is. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Is that because of Sydney Sweeney? No, I, I knew what it was before. Yet. Okay, yeah. I'll keep I'll my mouth it. shut. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, I think that's good. Any, any <laughs> anything else before anything else before we wrap this thing? No, I thought that was one of our best interviews. So good shit. Pat, I'm excited to hear yeah. your feedback when you get to hear I it. I can't so. wait to listen. Pat, It'll you were cool. awesome yeah. in it. You did great. Thank you. I pulled an AJ Hawk. I just sat in the background and didn't say shit. <laughs> I actually, yeah. I really wish Lou saw the sweatshirt. Fuck. <laughs> if you if you listen to the interview already, go back and listen again. Because the second time, Pat does ask an interesting question. So, yeah. Yeah really snuck in there directors yeah yep. but on that note big shout out big thank you 
to Lou Merloni for jumping on with us and doing that interview. Uh, hopefully not the last time that you guys get to see Lou on the podcast. As I said before, he's as good of a Red Sox and baseball mind as there is out there. But this has been episode 53 of Play Tessie. Uh, before you jump off, before you listen to the interview again, just remember, hit that subscribe button if you're listening on Apple, Spotify, the Odyssey app. Hit that subscribe button, rate five stars, leave a comment. Forget what we asked. We, what, what, were we, what were we asking people to comment about before? The jerseys. Jerseys. The jerseys. jerseys. Tell, us, tell us your thoughts on the jerseys. Would you trade, would you trade the yellows for the greens? Um, if you're on YouTube, do that there too. Also hit the subscribe button to the WEI page and follow our playlist. Uh, hit that thumbs up on the video too. That helps us out a ton. But also on socials, at Play Tessie, both on Twitter and Instagram. Helps us out a ton. We love interacting with you guys on socials, both from our personal accounts and from the Play Tessie account. So keep interacting, keep listening. Like we love pushing out content for you guys. We love when you guys listen. We love the feedback. We love interacting. So you guys keep it up. We'll keep it up. It's been great. Getting close to the season, man. Less than two weeks. Sammy and I will be in Fort Myers in less than a week. So big things ahead, both for the Sox and for the Play Tessie podcast. But on that note, for Sammy, Coop, and Pat, this has been Gordo for Play Tessie, episode 53, Toodaloo.